Let me let me share my screen here really quick so you can kind of take a look at what I am. Oh, once everybody sees the the slide presentation yes okay awesome <clears throat> sweet so thanks for coming out uh my name is danny uh most of you i don't see any too many new faces but i've been working at the library for about uh 15 16 years and been working inside of uh in some form or another with computers for the past 20 some odd years over 25 years or whatever. So I wanted to talk to you guys today about um, this really cool piece of software that was utilized during the development of the Digital Library on American Slavery project to help kind of push this project along. And so what we're going to talk about today is kind of go over what Azure DevOps is, do a little um, tour of the different services that it has inside of it and then go on from there to uh, a q a see if you guys have any questions or any thoughts or anything like that so that being said so uh, a couple of years ago we got the grant for uh, to put the digital library of american slavery i'm just going to call it dlos uh, together and in the middle of that project i think i mentioned in the last presentation we got hit with covid 19 and with COVID-19, we had sort of challenges that kind of came up with the work environment uh, due to all the different issues with the virus and new policies and revised policies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we had a situation where we have this development project and we have to get the work done, but people uh, that are working on the project are in different places, whether they're in an office or at their home, they're on different CPUs, they're on different times or different schedules, right? And this work now has to be done by people in these different places. So we needed to come up with sort of, or, or at least I should say we had an opportunity to try some different things out with the workflow. When you have different people in different places, the work still has to get done. And so that workflow now has to be distributed to those locations, to those different systems, right? And so in comes DevOps. So using Azure DevOps allows us uh, people working in the project to have a central repository for the project where you can store information, uh, work items inside of the project as well as the code itself right and so now because we have this centralized place to keep all this information each person working inside of the project can have their own bits and pieces of the project stored in that centralized location as your devops doesn't care where you're at as long as you have an internet connection and an account uh, you can be at your work computer and your office. Uh, another individual can be at their home office on a Mac at different times of the day and still contribute to the project itself, right? So I think I talked about a little bit last time, sort of the steps of how a project, and you guys are familiar with this, how a project gets done. There's all sorts of steps that have to happen. And before Azure DevOps, the way that we would get these things done was through these stages, right? Or steps. One step gets to the other step and you go through with the different parts of putting a project together, right? There's nothing wrong with this in a normal environment, but in an environment where different people are in different places working at different times, uh, the step-by-step -step process by which these things are done, if there's any kind of issue with one of those steps the potential to hold up a project delay it or there being problems completing the project start coming up right if uh, uh, if you can't get through each step you can't get to the next one without kind of working through it right and so that's why devops becomes an important thing that model of how to build a site or work through a project changes Right. So instead of 
sort of that waterfall-esque step-by-step process of going through uh, the project, you are now presented with the ability to continually add, continually create, and continually develop in these projects. You're not uh, limited to one person or one stage when you have three or four different people uh, putting in their components and their pieces and their parts of the project together, it sort of leads to this continual creativity cycle, right? You're no longer waiting for somebody else to do their job. You can work on your own stuff. And it seems like that's a pretty big advantage in that kind of environment, right? So what are we talking about when we're talking about Azure DevOps, right? So a couple of years ago, uh, Microsoft bought uh, GitHub, as well as, you know, they're always buying pieces of software. And so uh, what they start doing with these acquisitions is they start rolling components or pieces of these different uh, pieces of software into uh, their Azure, Azure cloud services. And that's what Azure DevOps is. It's a set of tools that Microsoft put together in the cloud that kind of helps the process of putting these uh, web applications or development projects. It makes it kind of faster to put these things together. And it's there's all sorts of tools that Microsoft put in there. The ones that I'm gonna be going through with you guys today are gonna to be the free stuff. And so to get into Azure, all you really need is, like you see there, just a computer, of course, access to the internet and a Microsoft account. So um, you can use whichever account that you have to create a Microsoft account. If you have a Gmail account, Yahoo account, and you can go ahead and set up. You can use your Xbox account if you want to use that. Uh, you can also use your UNCG uh, account as well, right? So for my purposes, for the DLAS project, I use the UNCG account. And the awesomeness of that is it allows you to see other user accounts from UNCG and ITS sort of maintains that, um, that space where all of these projects are getting put so that in the future, if you were to expand or want to move or change things around, and you're using that uncg.edu account, it's a little bit easier to work with ITS to expand the project, to, to have you know, uh, more people added to the project, or when, when you start getting into the non-free stuff, you can work with ITS to actually uh, put these things, you know, m move the project forward and do your expansion if you so needed to do that. But I'm saying you don't necessarily have to use the uncg.edu account. You can use whichever account you want. So let's take a look at what it looks like, right? The address to get in to the web interface is dev.azure.com. And let's take a look what that looks like. Right, so this is the main Azure site, and to get in, all I have to do is sign in. Now, I am currently signed into my UNCG account, so you're not going to be presented with the sign in process. And let's take a look at what the interface looks like. Okay, so inside of Azure, I have uh, different project spaces. I can come in here and set up a, as many projects as I want. Uh, Microsoft doesn't give you a limit to that. There are some limitations that I'll talk about later, but for now, if you wanted to set up a project, you start a new project and go from there. Let's take a look at DLAS. So clicking into DLAS, uh, I have uh, my first interface here, just kind of gives me a little bit of information about uh, the project itself, uh, who's in it. Uh, right now it's me, Richard, and Lee, and Vanessa, and kind of a couple of things, uh, updates on the project itself, right? And if I wanted to get information, so a little bit more generalized information, I can click on dashboards here on the left, 
and I have a customized interface that I can add, change, uh, remove things as I see fit. Uh, for my interface here, I kind of have it set up so I can take a look at the items that I have to work on inside the project, uh, the different parts, uh, updates to which branches inside the project itself to kind of see what's been going on with it, right? On the left-hand side of this interface, by the way, these are all of the Azure DevOps tools. There's a whole bunch of them. Uh, I'm using the free version of Azure, so a couple of these have some limitations. The ones we're going to focus on today are the wiki, the boards, and the repos. And we're going to go through all of them. So if I click on wiki here on the left-hand side, inside of the DLOS project, I am presented with information about the project itself. This is a centralized repository of information, right? So I can come in here, I can edit these wikis, I can add them. And this is where I would wanna keep pertinent information to the project itself. Something that somebody would want to know to keep track of. You can come in here and put code in here as well if you want to, but you start, this is sort of like if you start adding more people to the project where they can come and get information about the status of things, whichever you feel uh, is necessary for the project itself. Now, I do wanna say that uh, this particular project is in private mode. None of this information is out on the web. You can actually set it up to be public if you want, but for our purposes for this project, we're not wanting to share any of this info. It's really intended to make the uh, process of putting this project together a little bit faster and not necessarily to make it in the public domain. So pretty cool, right? There, there's a wiki with all sorts of information. And then the next part are the work items. So this is more of the project management side of putting these apps together, right? Keeping track of the of issues, problems. You can come in here and add work items. You can assign items to different people inside the project you can get the status and see what is going on with the project itself, what state it's in. And you can edit these things and delete them and kind of just get a good idea of the things that have the work that has to be done on this project. This doesn't necessarily have to tie into the code itself, but it's sort of like I was talking about it. It's more of the project management side of putting these things together. So if you wanted to put some things in here about the data, things that need to be added, who's working on what, you can get a good idea of the state of where the project is, right? And one of the other cool little bits that we hear is if I click on boards as a project manager or a person inside of the project itself, I'm kind of presented with a more visual way of understanding where the project is at, right? All these little different pieces and components. And you start looking at this and you're like, wow, okay. So uh, I don't necessarily have to sit there and have a meeting with my manager about these things. Uh, if somebody is off site, somebody's at the house, somebody's in their office, whatever, somebody can come in and take a look at the different pieces and parts to the project that have to get worked on. Pretty cool, right? So the last thing that I wanted to get into, and this is like the really, really cool stuff that really helped the Digital Libraries on American Slavery Project, and that is repos, right? So repos is essentially um, bits and pieces of GitHub. Microsoft rolled uh, functionality inside of GitHub into the Azure DevOps uh, suite, right? So you could still use GitHub independently of Azure, but Azure kind of gives you a little bit more of the enter enterprise features like, like doing these uh, project management things and items and all sorts of other little bits and pieces. That's not to say that you can't use GitHub as itself, as a standalone by itself inside of a project. You still can. This just, in Azure, gives you a little bit more features with it. So what are repos, right? Well, repos is essentially the central file storage 
of all of the files inside of the project, right? So when I go to uh, the People Not Property website, all of the files, all of the HTML, all of the classes, all of the programming bits, the CSS, the images, all that information is, excuse me, is sitting in the Azure cloud, right? And there's some distinct advantages to doing that. And we'll go through that here in a little bit. But if I browse, you know, I can see all the different views of the site, all the different um, files for the site itself, right? All the CSS files. I can come in here and take a look at all the JavaScript. And all of this stuff is sitting independently of the server that we host all these files uh, here locally on campus, right? All this stuff is sitting in Azure space. All these files are sitting up there in a central location. And that is different from the files that are sitting on the server itself. They're in two different places, right? So let's see and take a look at what some of these files look like. So, on the left-hand side, you see a, a section called branches. And what that essentially is, each branch of the, of the code base, the central code base, is an independent copy of those files, right? So if I take a look at branches, I see master. Master is like the carbon copy of what you see on dlos.uncg.edu. Anything that's on DLOS, the, the DLOS server is in master. It is like the main, uh, the main repository of code for the project itself. Now, if you take a look at this, you'll see a lot of different branches, right? And each branch is a copy of the master file with its own files that people can then uh, change, edit, maintain whatever it is that they want to do to their particular branch without affecting the master branch, right? So if we have somebody coming into the project and we don't want the changes to be live without testing them because we, we don't know what kind of things are happening inside of the files that they're editing, then we would want that person to have a copy of those files, an exact copy of master in some cases, so that they can work on their bits and their pieces of the project without affecting anybody else's works, any the, the work that anybody else is doing. And, and that, if you think about it, is a massive, massive change from the way we were doing uh, our, or developing these applications before. So if I go into master, let's just take a look at these files, right? So I go into DLAS and here, all these files exist on dlos.uncg.edu. If I go into some of these views here, let's go into deeds. Using the web interface, I can actually open this file inside the website and take a look at what it looks like, right? If I go into the fact, let me bring this out a little bit so you guys can see. You can see the HTML and all of the little code bits that are in there, right? Now, the cool thing about the web interface is that I can edit this file. I can come in here. And let's just add a little piece of text. This is best, right? Just a little bit of HTML. I can change all sorts of stuff on these pages. And so I want to save this file, so I commit it. And I'm presented with a little window where I can just put information. I updated with new info. And then I can commit my change, right? Now, the awesome thing inside of Azure DevOps is that it keeps track of all the changes that everybody does at any given time. So you see here, there's a history tab. I can click on that and get a full history of the file itself, right? Isn't that cool? And I can actually go in 
and see the changes that were made during the project, right? Adding all sorts of code to it. Very cool, right? Azure DevOps keeps track of all of this. I can go into the project site itself, and this happens at every level. I can click on the history and see all of the information that was used to put this project together and get a history of it. Like I can see Richard did some updates to the about page uh, in September. Uh, he actually put some more information there later at a later date, right? And I can see where all of the changes you know, where the, where the site comes together, where it splits apart, who's done the work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Isn't that cool? Very, very cool. So if I go back into branches, now that is master, right? So right now I'm doing work on the petition side of the uh, DLOS server. So instead of working directly with master, I made a copy of it and started uploading my changes inside of the DLOS server as well. Now, when I come in here and take a look at those files, right, I can go to views. What did I edit here? I went into deeds and I think I changed something on the fact. And those changes are not there because the files that are inside of that copy have not been changed they, they haven't been brought down from master. They haven't been updated. It is an independent copy. And this is where I talk about, you know, I was talking earlier about that continual cycle of creativity. This is how it happens. With the ability to have our own copy of this code, uh, each person can work on their pieces of code or an HTML and CSS and scripts or any aspect of the of the project itself independently from one another you can download your own copy put your own stuff into it and then say okay my stuff's ready i want to upload it to master we bring those changes over to master review the code take a look at it and publish it to uh, the site itself and then that gets updated right the the days of of updating code live on the server itself have completely changed when using this model or this this development style right and it's actually really cool so in the project itself we had times where richard would go in and add images and change css and make little bits and adjustments and i would make my changes lee would make his changes and they were all at different times and completely independent of one another we merge everything together, throw it onto the server, and the project actually, the, the time and the process of putting all that, it's a little bit easier than we had in the past, right? Pretty cool. So let me see here. So that is repos, right? All the files and stuff are sitting here. And this is the web interface for these things. Uh, one of the other things that we can do is I can change the branches here. I can look at the different branches and see what else any anybody else is doing. And Azure DevOps will maintain the history of you know all the different branches and all the different files in this in these projects. So now the other component of this, the web interface is a little bit limiting in that you can come in here and add files, edit files, move things around, no big deal. But in terms of some of the coding stuff that we do on the on the back side of this, the web interface is a little bit limiting. So in those cases, and generally speaking, we put these things together using uh, Microsoft's uh, coding environment or their coding software uh, called Visual Studio. And let me show you what that looks like. This is the other half of the project. This is the web interface, right? And so on my local computer, I have a copy of Visual Studio. And we use Visual Studio to build these things out, right? And so inside the Visual Studio interface, locally on my local laptop, uh, I can kind of see that uh, on the lower right-hand side, 
that I am in the master branch, which is the main one, right? And if I take a look at the files, and this is, they are the same files you'll see that are sitting up on the server itself, except this is a local copy of all these files. They, I brought it down. When you connect Visual Studio to Azure DevOps, it brings all the files down locally. I can be on my laptop at home. I can be on my work computer. It can be a Mac or PC, whichever. Uh, Visual Studio has some free versions of it that also connect into uh, Azure DevOps and will also bring these files down. But you can kind of see where, where if I have my own copy, I don't have to worry about somebody else's copy. The changes and stuff that I make are my changes until I decide to move those into that main repository of files, right? So inside of here, like I said, here are the files. And so when I go into this project and I wanna see what the changes are and what's been happening, uh, inside of Visual Studio is a Git menu, right? Because we're using GitHub. And then we just sync the project up. And let's see what it does. So it's going to go out. It's going to go to uh, Azure DevOps. It's going to start looking for all the bits and pieces and changes. And then change my local files with that information. And if you take a look, that is right there. There's my change. At this point, all, all I would have to do is publish these changes to the server itself and we're done. Pretty cool, right? And so you start to see like the, the usefulness of this software, being able to make changes from the website, being able to make changes from my local computer and Azure DevOps keeps all of that information centralized, right? So I can come into the menu as well and also take a look at the history of this stuff. Right, and here's my information. Just like the web interface, I can click at any of these, uh, this history on this master branch and I can see the changes that were made. Uh, inside of Visual Studio, I am also presented with those same branches, right? So I can come in here switch to a different branch of the code, make my changes and upload them into DevOps. So let me just close this really quick. So let's go back and say, hey, I, you know, I don't want this change or whatever with this uh, page. And if I save it, right, Visual Studio will show me that I have a change that's been made. And so I can send this back into Azure. So if I come in here and say, okay, this is a change back. I can commit my change, right? It's all right, so my change is there. And Visual Studio tells me, hey, you have a change. Do you want to like push that out? And so I'm just going to resync. And it's going to do its thing again. It's checking all the differences and everything that it has to do. And it pushes the information back out to Azure DevOps. Pretty cool, right? So let's go take a look at the site. And this is brand, this is the petitions branch. Let's go back into master and let's take a look at that FAQ file. And the information is gone, right? If I click and look, take a look at history, there's the last change that I made inside of the software. That's pretty cool. So what Azure DevOps gives us is the, the ability, uh, less stress by the way, but the ability to actually have different people working on uh, different parts of the project uh, at different times from different systems you know, it doesn't really make a difference because Azure DevOps is keeping track of it, right? So why is this important, right? Why, you know, I wanted to talk to you guys today about this because not only is it cool, but, but because of uh, teamwork, right? Um, I, I 
earnestly believe, honestly believe that, that when different people in the library, you know, with different abilities and, and, and the way they do their work, uh, that when we put everything together, we can build these projects better, faster, and we don't necessarily get into a, a situation where uh, developers or any one person is responsible for the entire project itself, right? Uh, we can branch out and utilize different skills, have different people get into these projects uh, with their own unique set of skills. Uh, you don't necessarily have to be a coder. If you know HTML, if you're a project manager, if you are uploading images, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And people that are responsible for these projects, the project manager themselves, don't necessarily have to sit and wait for one particular part of that project to work itself through for it to happen. Granted, you know, there's work that has to be done by everybody, but the, the process of putting in uh, or making this, developing this project becomes a little bit faster when you don't have to go through that step-by-step -step process. And so um, does anybody have any questions, thoughts, premonitions, ideas, or anything awesome about uh, what they just seen? Thoughts, concerns? So we did have a question in the chat um, about whether or not there would be a shareable URL for your slideshow. A URL for my presentation? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can, I, I have not made that public, so I haven't shared the, the slideshow, so. All right. But awesome. I can. Yes, huh? <laughs> well, there was a request, so. Sweet. Um, all right. Back here. Other thing just was a comment that this has very cool project management tools. Uh, all right. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very cool stuff. Um, moving forward, what I'd like to do, right? So the previous presentation, I kind of just touched on these things just a little bit. And I'm, you know, um, with this presentation, just get a little bit more in depth with the process of how these things are put together and how how the, the workflow changed because of COVID-19. So the next one that I want to do is sort of the, the building blocks of how the, the code and the building of the site itself, because there were some changes into the language and uh, the the development style that we used to put these things together changed. And so the next one that I want to go over is sort of like that third piece and kind of get a little bit into the code and show really the cool stuff of what happened when we put this project together. So at least to me, it's cool. <laughs> and we will have a third session and it will be in about a month. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and let's see, Leah asks, it looks a little complicated. I agree. It does look a little complicated. Uh, was there a learning curve for team members? Yes, there was a learning curve for me as well. Uh, we, for, since I've been here, since 2000 or whatever, there has been a certain way that we put these projects together, which had sort of advantages and disadvantages. And that process had been in place for 20 years, something like that. But with COVID, we sort of had the opportunity to kind of read look at how we do some of these things and putting these websites and web projects together. And it was just too good an opportunity to pass yeah. up to be able to push these projects forward, right? It actually made things easier on the, one. well, once we figured out and learned it, it actually made things easier for us and a little bit less stressful because, because of some of those bits and pieces inside of the software, right? We could each have our own set of code and not have to worry about what, if what we're doing and the changes of what we're doing are affecting somebody else or affecting their workflow, right? It is essentially my work inside the project, other people have their work, and then we bring it all together 
and uh, merge everything together and publish it out to the site. And there was some definite advantages to that, where before everybody be working off the same set of code. And so if somebody is making some changes, making some updates, you have the potential to completely affect the work that somebody else is doing. In this environment, it's you and your work, somebody else and somebody else's work. And then you have, Pete, you know, uh, you know, he had Richard on top of it, taking a look at it, myself looking at this code. And so it actually, in the end, came out, became something that was like really cool and really applicable to our projects. And I hope it's, it's completely, it becomes a useful thing for everybody else when new projects start coming through, right? Like I was saying before, if there is something that we have to work on and there's some changes to the HTML or some changes to CSS or even the code itself, you guys don't necessarily have to sit there and wait for us. You log into DevOps, look for the file, work on your branch, make the changes, the changes are sitting up there so that next time a developer or whoever else is working with you, they see your changes right there, right? Okay, th th these are the things that are done. And so the work becomes completely independent from one another. And that has a lot of advantages inside of uh, the development workflow. But yes, very difficult to put it together. But once it's set up and done, everything just tend to work better after that, especially in the COVID environment where, like I was saying before, you have different people in different places working at different times on different systems. At that point, it's like, ooh, the workflow needs to change with that, right? So it sounds like it was probably worth the upfront effort to get everything set up. Correct, correct, completely, completely. It was very exciting uh, and stressful as well, but less stressful than the alternative. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> that makes sense. All right. Any other questions for Danny while we're here? Awesome. Awesome. Be on the lookout for uh, the next session. And in that one, we're going to get into the code to actually show how this site was put together, sort of the building blocks of it. And when you see all the different pieces put together, uh, hopefully that leads us to uh, the, the next stage of putting these uh, web science and web applications together, which I hope is so much better for everybody. Um, we did have one last question come in. Is this uh is any of the info useful as an export i wondered about project files that might help researchers or other coders elsewhere yeah yeah because of this is using github you can actually share uh all of the information on the site you can have a public facing azure devops project site where you can have a private site uh azure lets you uh, zip up and download all pieces of your codes. So if you had to share it with somebody or back it up or whatever, you can do that as well. Uh, for DLOS, we have everything set to private. Uh, that's just a personal preference. I don't want anybody from uh, outside, you know, of of the project itself to be poking around the code, especially you know, uh, hackers or anything like that taking a look at the information on how the site is put together. So, but you definitely have the option of making the site public and making it a public project. But if you set it to private, um, you can still have all sorts of people, whoever I want to add to the project to come take a look at it under the, the restrictions that uh, Microsoft puts together for the, dev, the DevOps project. Now, I guess I should mention that, I am using the free version of the software and there are some limitations like I think per site you get like five different users if you have to go above five different users if I wanted to add seven or eight people to the project I would then have to talk to ITS or put in a credit card for Microsoft to start charging a couple of bucks a month for the services 
right now because we're a small shop, everything is completely free. Not everything, but most things that we use it for are free. So. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks so much to Danny and thanks to all of you for joining us. And like Danny said, keep an eye out for the announcement about the uh, third session in this series, which will be coming up in February. Um, and if you do have any questions about the ULVLC, please feel free to contact me or Sam. And if you have any questions about Azure DevOps, please don't contact me. Definitely contact Danny. He's <laughs> going to be the one who's able to answer them. So, all now. right. Oh, well, much better, much better than I could. All right. <laughs> Take care. Have a nice afternoon. Thank y'all. Bye.